Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this event in the American Inspiration Author Series presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, and Porter Square Books. I'm Margaret Talkett, the series producer. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us in the land of family history, looking at the good and the bad, and in the case of tonight's author, Ancestor Trouble. On your screen is the schedule for our hour-long event featuring Maud Newton and her new book. After a brief illustrated presentation, Ms. Newton will be in conversation with author and journalist Casey Sepp. More on them in a moment. For now, some quick housekeeping items. We are in a Zoom webinar format, which means that your microphone is muted and your video is off. We cannot take your comments in the chat button on your Zoom, but do look there for links that are relevant to tonight's talk. Many of you shared questions in advance. Those are already with Casey Sepp. Thank you for those. If you have additional queries, we may be able to get to one or two or a few. Put those into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll serve up as many as we can and get them answered. Tonight's program is being recorded by my colleagues at NEHGS's Brew Family Learning Center. The video will be published on our website in the days ahead. You will be Zoom emailed when it's posted freely accessible on the American Inspiration video archive. Now for some brief words about the book tonight, um, this is where you get real insight into this topic. Um, it comes from reading Ms. Newton's thought provoking book, Ancestor Trouble, A Reckoning and Reconciliation. It is full of true to life dilemmas, past and present, much food for thought for family historians. It also looks at the study of genealogy where it comes from and where it is going. Ms. Newton was featured this week on the New York Times Book Review podcast, and the book's reviews have been entrancing. Copies of Ancestor Trouble can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books. Order online, use the code AMINSP22, and you will get a signed copy. Ms. Newton has signed book plates and they are on their way to the bookstore. The books will go out next week. So this is your opportunity to get this book hot off the press. Now for some brief words about our featured guests. Maud Newton has written for the New York Times Magazine, Harper's, the New York Times Book Review and Oxford American. She was one of the earliest and most prominent literary bloggers. She grew up in Miami and graduated from the University of Florida with degrees in English and law. Our presenting partners at Porter Square Books are, are they're going to introduce our moderator this evening. Catherine, welcome. Uh, thanks to everyone on your team for tonight's presentation. Over to you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Hello, everyone. My name is Catherine Pearson, and I'm the events manager here at Porter Square Books, and we are just absolutely delighted to be a part of tonight's event. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce our incredible moderator tonight, Casey Sepp. Casey Sepp is a staff writer at The New Yorker and a best-selling author of Furious Hours, Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harper Lee. Born and raised on the Eastern shore of Maryland, she graduated from Harvard College and earned an MPhil from the University of Oxford. Casey will be joining us on screen later, but for now, let's move on with the event, Margaret. Thanks, Catherine. I am so glad to be working with you in your role as events manager. And Maud, welcome to you. We are really delighted that you're here. Um, thanks so much. And thanks for getting us started. We're really eager to hear from you. Over to you. I'm so pleased to be here, and it's just such a treat to be able to, um, you know, be here with so many family historians. I know that so many of you are also researching your families um, and, and sort of trying to decide how to tell those stories, either, um, you know, for your own families or maybe in a book. And so I'm, I'm very familiar with those, you know, with all the questions around that. And, and we have a lot of really good advanced questions um, on that front. But um, yeah, so I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about the impetus for writing the book. And I thought we could start with a photo of my maternal grandparents. So, my 
my maternal grandparents um, were married for a very short time. Their marriage um, over three years resulted in my grandmother. And you can probably tell from the photo that it wasn't the happiest of unions. So my grandfather, who I never met, was said to have been married 13 times. And my grandmother was this really over the top, fun, sassy, sex, uh, Texan storyteller um, who would say things like that he spent so much money, I couldn't even buy your mother a goddamn toothbrush. So that was the vibe around that. And she and my mom would tell these amazing stories and they seemed both improbable and also, as I say in the book, knowing my family, not unlikely. And so um, this grandfather's father was said to have killed a man with a hay hook. Uh, and I turned, it turned out that this was actually true. And in the next photo, um, you can see that I, I did visit his grave. Um, what I found in the course of researching Charlie was that this was a really sympathetic story, actually. I had envisioned this over-the-top, swashbuckling hothead. And in fact, I discovered that the story, he was kind of a hero. And he died um, in a mental institution in Texas. Uh, and I laid a gravestone for him. So on the right, you can see uh, all of the gravestones that just had a number. Uh, as his did before I placed the stone that you can see in the photograph on the left. So that was one of the things that was really meaningful to me. And it sort of permeated this research, this sense that, you know, people that we may view as sort of villains may turn out to be the opposite or something much more nuanced. And also people who we, um, have wholeheartedly and unreservedly admired may turn out to be something more complex. And so in the next photograph, um, you'll see this photo, this uh, very hungry horse um, pulling my grandmother and her little sister and their grandfather um, in Texas sometime around 1914. Um, these were very, very poor people. And so I, I developed a whole mythology around my Texan grandmother and sort of this sense that she came from straight shooting real people who unlike my father's family would never have enslaved people. And I came to find that that was not true, that I had ancestors on her side who also enslaved people and who sued each other over the right to enslave those people. And I thought that my family going all the way back to, you know, the beginnings of their time in this country were Southern on every line. But what I found was that part of one of part of this line um, actually went back to Mary Bliss Parsons, who um, some of you may know was accused of being a witch uh, in Northampton. She was tried twice. Uh, once she brought a civil claim. Uh, and she won. And then uh, many years later, she was tried again in a criminal proceeding and she won again. And so at first, when I discovered this history, I was really thrilled, you know, wow, this, this person who was accused of being a witch and beat the charges. And, um, but over time, my understanding of Mary and her family became more complicated. The Parsons were very involved in the genocide and displacement of the Nanatuck people in that area. And Mary's family, uh, when later she was accused of being a witch again, when rumors started again, the family made an example of, an of, a, of a Black woman who may have been enslaved and they sentenced her to lashes in a trial. And, you know, one thing that might be interesting for you to know is that, you know, you do all this research, you know, you write your book, it's out in the world, 
And then you find yourself still dipping into those archives. And so this very weekend, I discovered and conferred with uh, the archivist of the museum in Springfield. Um, I discovered that Mary Bliss Parsons may herself have enslaved someone. So this is a much more complex story. This is a person who was persecuted. And this is also a person who may have persecuted others. And so that's been part of my journey, just sort of reckoning with nuance. Um, and then in the last um, image here, this is taken from a Mississippi newspaper called the Delta Democrat Times. This is my self-given namesake, Maud Newton. Um, she was someone my dad's family never wanted to talk about. She was kind of mysterious. I knew she was an architect. I knew a few salacious stories, but my grandmother, my Mississippi Delta grandmother was always kind of clamping down on, on whatever the secret about Maud Newton was. And so I, my given name is Rebecca, but when I started writing, I took the name Maud, you know, as sort of a badge of pride, also this sort of outlier in my family, looking up all this stuff. And what I discovered about Maud is that she was a writer, which was exciting. But unfortunately, a lot of what she wrote really um, was very political and ties very directly into this moment that we're in today. She was in favor of segregation. Um, she, you know, was angry about Black people voting. And so, you know, my book really attempts you know both to deal with all of this family history and then to go deep on a lot of other issues so i look at genealogy i'm not a genealogist but you know as a family historian um genetic genealogy and all the dna you know sort of um, research and implications around that um i go into the science around genetics and epigenetics and what we can and can't know around that the age-old questions of nature versus nurture um, but with you know the new sort of science around it and all the arguments around epigenetics and then i go into generational wealth racism um and and finally i take a look at ancestor spirituality um and the the sort of spiritual importance to people um, across the world and across time of ancestors. And so I'm so excited um, to talk with Casey Sepp, who's just an absolutely brilliant writer, who I'm sure, you know, she's spent so much time herself digging in archives. So you may have questions for her as well. Her book is absolutely beautiful. And I'm, I'm just so honored that she has agreed to talk with me about Ancestor Trouble today. Hey there, Maud. What a pleasure to be here. I'm going to grab my copy and wave it around because it can't be said often enough that um, you wrote a beautiful and fascinating book. And I, um, it's kind of you to say people should ask me questions, but I'm really glad I get to ask you questions. And I know we have endless of them from the audience too. And I feel like already what you've put out there, even for folks who haven't read the book, um, really does necessitate this straightforward, um, you know, it's like going to the magician at the front of the stage and saying, how did you do the trick, right? I mean, I've used Ancestry.com. I'm sure the, you know, hundreds of people with us have used newspapers.com. But, you know, you just showed us what you can do with a photograph. You just took us to a mental hospital. I know that a lot of your research for the book did involve going places, talking to people. So let me just get it out of the way because you know, people ask this question 50 different ways and submitting their questions in advance. And I immediately wanted to ask it of you when I first read your book. Um, what are the unexpected archives you found, the surprising sources you learned how to use? You know, give us some of your tricks right off the bat that brought this book to life, not just the things we already know about census records, family photo albums, that kind of thing. Really tell us some of the other things you made use of. 
Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question. <clears throat> and I think the first thing I would say is that time is your friend, you know, as someone who's researching family history. So, you know, often I would find in the case of Charlie, for example, my great, uh, great grandfather who was said to kill a man with a hay hook. You know, first I found him in the census, I found marriage records, then I thought, hmm, I wonder if there's anything about that in the Dallas Morning News. Um, you know, a hay hook killing is kind of weird if that's really true, maybe there's something about it. Well, sure enough, there was, um, you know, an article about this, um, and then I, I wrote to the Dallas Public Library, They're, they have a genealogy division that's extremely helpful, you know, for a small fee, they'll, they'll look into archives for you of, of newspapers that are not otherwise available. So they found some stories that revealed that um, my great grandfather was acting in self defense, that the neighbors um, came to his aid and that he was ultimately not um, even tried on the charge of, of killing this man. Um, but meanwhile, as you might imagine, this was, you know, all over the newspapers, the sort of news of the weird story, um, poor Charlie. And then, you know, so I thought, well, you know, I, I called the jails, I, I called the courthouses, there were no records. Um, but eventually I thought to check the law books. And there were some, you know, decisions from what was then the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals that actually had this harrowing testimony mm -hmm. from the stepdaughter of the man Charlie accidentally killed. And the stepdaughter um, had been, you know, the, the man had been accused of trying to rape his stepdaughter, and he was convicted of that. And Charlie's testimony was part of what sent him to prison. So that, um, you know, was really a very powerful discovery, um, particularly because I myself had experienced some, you know, similar harms when I was a child and I felt no one had stepped in. And so I thought, wow, you know, I Anyway, so to answer your question, you know, then, then I eventually, you know, corresponded with various Texas agencies and discovered that he was buried behind the mental institution. But I feel like for me, it's sort of, you know, you try one thing, maybe you find something, you try something else. And, you know, just sort of imagination and sitting with it is your friend. Mm -hmm. Do you think your book is a, I mean, we're here with this eager audience of some amateur, some professional genealogists. Do you think that your book could be a blueprint or do you think every family has a bespoke history and what worked for you might not work for someone else? Or how common do you think any of these efforts are? I think that my experience is common in that it really does require a lot of different avenues most of the time. So, you know, when you get stuck, kind of need to pull back and think about about that. Um, so I don't I don't know that you know there are parts of my family uh, research that would certainly map onto other people's experiences. I mean, trying to find out, you know, um, how many of my ancestors enslaved people. Um, you know, required me to go to the census to what is unfortunately called the slave schedules, um, you know, and, and find my ancestors there. And then the people they enslaved listed only by, you know, uh, biological sex and age. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, but in the case of my ancestor who was accused of being a witch, that there was no sort of census document of that kind at the time. So, you know, I just happened to be in correspondence with the archivist at the Springfield Museum about a related issue. And she told me about a database and I'll, I'll send this to Margaret so that she can send it out at the end. But this really valuable database of black lives in the colonial um, Connecticut River Valley. And there I found this, um, this person, um, Toby was, was their name, who may have been 
uh, enslaved by my ancestor, they were referred to as a servant. Um, and according to the archivist I spoke with at that time, that was most frequently for a black person, a euphemism for someone who was enslaved. So, you know, the, the usual thing of going to the census documents, everyone's going to need to do that. And then pop, possibly go into the wills, you know, um, in the area. I've found a lot of wills in various Mississippi archives, and they are dispiriting. But, you know, I find that by and large descendants of black people who uh, um, were enslaved by my ancestors are happy when I include this information in my tree because it makes it easier for, the, for them to find these ancestors who, you know, whose personhood was so denied that they, they were stripped even of a name. Mm -hmm. I heard that sigh, and at first I thought you were sighing about being like in the records rooms of these Mississippi courthouses, because I've done a little bit of that where I was going to ask you the extent to which I think some of us, the hope and the dream is, well, this is all digitized. I just look at an OCR document. I control F my family, and it's done. But I gather from you, and I wonder, tell us a little bit more about those slave schedules and some of those records rooms, because there were some questions um, submitted in advance specifically about tracking um, you know, family enslavement um, from both sides. And also in, in your family's case, you were also really trying to do work around indigenous populations and how your early ancestors related to Native Americans. So talk to us about those new resources and are they digitized? How do people find them? Um, what are the ways that you, I know your book especially does a lot to acknowledge the gaps because part of what you found is what you couldn't find you know what was unknowable and what was not preserved in a certain sense so talk to us a little bit about that and you know again i think it's fine if part of the sigh is you had to read a lot you had to go to a lot of places because ancestry.com has made it seem like oh i just sit in my living room and it's all done but of course you know even just from one family how much of this is still out there in the world to be tracked down Yes. So, for example, with my grandfather's many marriages, I have found um, a total of 10 marriages to nine women so far. Uh, I did have to go to Dallas and go to the courthouse and go to the library and look at historical records to unearth all of that. Um, it was not what I needed was not digitized. In many, many cases, I have relied on digital records. Um, and, and I want to just acknowledge that my search into my um, colonial ancestors' relationship to the displacement and killing of Indigenous people is, I've barely scratched the surface. But in the case of my ancestor, uh, Joseph Parsons, who lived in in Northampton um, and in Springfield, those histories are very well developed. Um, they may be written from a sort of, you know, um, perspective that's very sympathetic to Joseph Parsons and not to the people who he displaced, but you know, they're, that family is very well documented. You know, on the other hand, you'll still find things like this discovery that my ancestor may may have enslaved, you know, that his wife, also my ancestor, may have enslaved someone. Um, uh, you know, in a, in a few cases, uh, you know, one thing I should say is that, um, you know, the NEHGS has an absolutely amazing um, you know, resource in the genealogists that are on call. I mean, as so many people on this call know, um, you know, $99, if you can afford that per year is just, you know, a reasonable price to pay for access to, you know, to someone who can help you find these, these things. And I've also turned to the New York Public Library quite a bit because I, I live in Queens in New York City. Um, but yeah, so, so those kinds of things have been helpful, but there were some situations where I was either going to have to travel or hire someone. Um, so in the case of my great aunt Maud Newton, I discovered that she had an archive at the University of Mississippi of her writings, 
so I did hire someone to, um, I tried to get photocopies, but for various reasons, I had to hire someone. And, and so she went into the archive and, and photocopied their relevant documents. Um, another part of my journey was trying to trace back my um, Newton ancestors, who I believe came from Duplin County, North Carolina. Um, I haven't been able to trace them back beyond that. And thanks to the help of a genealogist I hired there who went deep into those, you know, historical minutes, court records, et cetera, I believe that my Jesse Newton was the child of an unmarried woman named Sally Newton. Mm -hmm. um, and that that was sort of the thing that that my family was trying to hide all this time when they were cagey about the Newtons. So um, yeah, it's just, it's really a mix. I mean, the archives online are constantly growing. You know, there are always new projects, you know, every few years, my grandfather seems to have a new marriage pop up, you know? <laughs> um, so I may get to 13 yet, but, um, you know, that's, yeah, so it's, it really just depends on the line. And I think for a lot of us, you know, who are family historians, you know, true genealogists or amateur genealogists like me, the search is frustrating, though it may be part of the fun. And I'm sure you had that experience too. Well, I shouldn't say more, but I would imagine you had that experience too as you were researching Harper Lee's life. Sure, yeah, I did some family history. I mean, I just wanna agree with you all hail public librarians. I can remember reaching out to them in various places in the country and you know, they just take on queries and they know their resources better than anyone. Things published, unpublished, you know, bound with paper clips. They tell you, oh yeah, that family or you know, that church that no longer exists. So I feel like you're pointing in all the right directions for folks and this is a crowd who kind of knows where to look or knows how to solicit help. But great of you to lift up surrogates too, because of course not everybody can go everywhere. But um, I have kind of, I had wanted to ask you about this, this talk so far makes it seem like your book is only your family. You know, you'll only get the Newtons if you dig in. But of course what you do is look at genealogy at every scale, you know, your family, your family line, your cultural history, scientific theories of these things. And I was gonna ask you a question about scale, but let me take another audience question here because you've alluded to it several times. And I feel like probably this is, this is an important one for you to answer and important for people to think about. There was a question about family dynamics and if writing your book has affected the way that you relate to your family. And um, there's actually a second part of that question from someone else because that, I, I believe that person wonders about your living relatives you know, has it caused any friction or um, strife or brought about any reconciliation as the title suggests. But there was another question too, which is, has it changed your relationship to your ancestors? So take a minute, and I'm curious in both directions, um, li living and, and dead, what has this changed? Because I think for some people who are doing this kind of research, the hope would be to publish a book. And I don't know if you want to caution them about that or you know, encourage them, but tell us a little bit. The book's been out for a week now. So you know, total strangers are reading it and reaching out probably. So um, what's it been like for you? Yeah, well, you know, my family is under the best of circumstances, fairly complex. Um, you know, and, and I should say, Casey read an early version of this book and she really helped me um, with some of my discussions in the um, ancestor spirituality part about mm -hmm. histories of, of Christianity and, and just had some great notes all the way through, but is in no way responsible for any errors or inelegant phrasings. That I'm proud to be associated with this book, but that's why I'm here. But tell us, I'm so, I mean, I remember reading that early version. Here we are, you know, a year later, what's it like? And, you know, should we all go do this? Or would you say, oh my gosh, quit while you're ahead and don't publish a book about your family? I mean, I, you know, so my mother's side of the family is very um, focused on truth telling. Mm. Um, and, you know, while I'm not sure that my mom, you know, I, she hasn't read the book and I don't know if she will, um, but she gave me carte blanche to write um, 
you know, write what I needed to write, trusting that I would tell the truth. Um, and yeah, so I feel like I really inherited this kind of need to be honest. Um, and that's, that's very sort of not the way that I have experienced um, much of my father's family, which is much more sort of like a Mississippi Delta approach, at least in the older generations of let's just kind of put this under the rug. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't want to understate the um, emotional difficulties for a family of someone writing a book like this. On the other hand, I think intention is important. You know, I wrote it in, a, in an open hearted way. Um, there was no desire to do any score settling on any in any direction um, in the sense of approaching it through anger or wanting to put someone down. It was really just more using myself and my exploration as a lens for, for looking at all of this stuff. And I would say that the one didactic point I have in the book um, that's really important to me is that in this moment where there are a lot of questions about how we should talk about histories like slavery, histories of what happened to indigenous people, what, what people like my ancestors did to indigenous people, I think it's really important for all of us to be a little brave and be able to step forward and really be able to make it personal. You know, when we know about these stories, I, I fully understand the impulse to um, not want to, to bring them forward because it's painful to admit, you know, that one's ancestors were involved in such terrible things. But for me to step forward and say, my ancestors came from this. Um, my ancestors did this. And, you know, in the case of slavery, it was just a little more than 150 years ago. You know, I'm 50 years old now. So to me, that's the blink of an eye at this age. And so, you know, the more that we can sort of not argue with people about theories and the more we can make it personal and say, my ancestors did this and here's how I feel about it. You know, I think that we have a much better um, chance of, of having really meaningful conversations. And so the book is very much written from that place of this is my family history and it's a lot, you know, and it's very, you know, unique and frankly crazy, um, you know, in a lot of different ways, but some of the problems of my family are also problems that permeate our society. And, you know, we often say, oh, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And when is that ever really more true than in the case of each of us individually with our families? And so the idea that, you know, researching our family histories is some narcissistic endeavor and some pointless thing and we all just want to show we're descended from Charlemagne or whatever, you know, I, th I think that's really wrong, you know, and as you know, Casey, I mean, my interest in the spiritual sort of view of ancestors across the world and across time that, you know, has been really sublimated um, in sort of the, the white European dominated West, particularly since the enlightenment, um, you know, where we're all kind of individuals like Athena jumping off of our parents' head and we can control our own destinies. Um, you know, I think we've really lost something there, you know, so yes, it's great that we're not obliged to be serfs because our parents were serfs, mm -hmm. but, you know, this, we've lost this sense of a continuity back through time and a sense of connectedness beyond say the last few generations. And, and so that's why, you know, I really do feel that a lot of us are, are yearning for something 
you know, we're looking in our DNA, maybe we are searching for our biological parent or whether we have a, a gene that predisposes us to an illness or, you know, a family cut off from us by slavery or the, or the Holocaust. But a lot of us are also searching for something that's a lot more ineffable. Um, and, you know, and to me that, you know, became a really important inquiry in the book. Yeah, I think that's beautifully put. And, and to the spirit of kind of making sure folks listening understand the book, it's true that you have um, several chapters about genetic testing, 23andMe, genetic determinism, you know, does depression run in your family? Um, you know, trying to, does creativity run in your family? Are the two related? You, you take up a lot of scientific questions and look at the current state of research and um, really connect genealogy to genetics in a way that I think um, many people are doing right now, right? Like they're doing the 23andMe in order to fill out their family tree and they're interested in that kind of genetic information. And so it's so interesting to hear you on the other side of this long research project to really um, you know, find a way to embrace your ancestors that is not, you know, genetics or destiny. Um, and I wonder, I, I want to make sure this was not a question from the audience. This is one of mine. And then we're going to go and we're going to take some questions that have come in as this conversation has unfolded. But selfishly, I want to ask you, um, you, you've told us about Charlie and we saw that picture of you at the hospital where he was buried. And I just feel like one of the most beautiful, people can hear in this conversation how thoughtful, how serious, um, just how deliberate and intentional you are with things. And I felt like one of the most plaintive moments in the book is, is when we learn about the headstone that you bought for Charlie. And I wonder if you could just tell us what's on it and you know why you chose that and what it means for you. Because I do think for some people, you know, this conversation is gonna lead them to go ask the hard questions, read the difficult history. And there can be a lot of sadness and ambivalence or anger, you know, at what you didn't know or what you were told that wasn't true. And so um, tell us what's on his headstone and tell us why you did it and um, maybe, you know, he's this great example of, you know, the villain who became a hero, which is one kind of journey the book makes. So um, tell us that. And while you do that, I, I'm going to look like I'm distracted, but I'm going to be looking at all of these great questions that I know came in. Fantastic. So, yes, um, I had a hard time deciding what to say on Charlie's headstone. Um, and I settled on not forgotten. Um, you know, sometimes the, the simplest words are, are really the most accurate and, and the most heartfelt. Um, and, you know, to your point, this, so yeah, I mean, this is, you know, the book is called Ancestor Trouble and, you know, a reckoning is right there, but a reconciliation is a big part of it. And <laughs> thanks. And the reconciliation... And the reconciliation part of it, um, you know, maybe there's a there's a space for a larger reconciliation in the culture if more of us do this, and maybe there's a space for more, you know, reconciliations within my own family, possibly through the book or not. But for me, the reconciliation, um, which has been really deeply meaningful and really filled with joy, um, is that you know, in researching all of these difficult things and really sitting with them in a meditative way and some of the practices that might strike, that will strike some people as a bit more out there that I describe in the book. Um, you, you, to be fair, kind of acknowledge they were out there for you for, for some period of time, but you've come to create a kind of syncretic method for you. So just everybody can learn and grow and um, think about other ways of relating to their past. So I, yeah, I think it's really beautifully done in the book. Thanks. And so, you know, I, so to be clear, I'm not really too interested in whether, you know, my spiritual connection that I now feel I have to my ancestors is objectively true or simply a process of my own sort of psychological healing journey. It really doesn't matter to me. I, you know, those, those two things have come to seem a lot less easily separated 
over the course of writing this book. But one thing I will say is that, you know, recognizing all of these painful histories um, and acknowledging them has made it also easier for me to really be filled with joy about the positive things that I receive from my ancestors that, you know, that they have passed down to me. And it's re reduced my confusion about how I want to show up in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's made it easier for me to show up as a more open-hearted person uh, with a lot more clarity around the gifts that they've passed down. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just think not forgotten is such an admirable goal <laughs> for all of us um, because, you know, we do want to forget the painful things and sometimes in our sorrow or depression, we forget the joyful things. So I just, I love that headstone and it's really moving to me. And um, while you were answering that, there's a great question, um, which I feel like I'm gonna pick up the book again and encourage people, we are not scraping the surface of Maud's family and we have not even talked about the church her mother started or the menagerie of pets you grew up with, the, you know, the grand new, you know, all of these just phenomenal character, Dickensian in their detail and the way you bring them to life. But someone would like to know about the kind of reluctance or resistance that you encountered when you were looking into quote unquote um, unsavory characters. Um, so someone like Charlie, I think they're responding to that or um, slave owners or, or, or any of these people who are quote unquote unsavory resistance within yourself or within those you were trying to talk to, you know, living relatives, kind of anyone, how did you overcome that? Yeah, so first of all, the resistance within myself, um, you know, I did encounter a little bit of that when I uh, had this discovery about my mom's mother's family. I talked at the beginning about how I mythologized them in my mind, you know, as sort of amazing, honest, true, pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of folks. Um, and so it was painful to find that, you know, that I had ancestors in, in the, you know, uh, at least some of those lines who had enslaved people as well. Um, but, you know, I, I really do believe, I'm, I don't consider myself, you know, a, any kind of practicing Christian or, or a believer, but I, I take from the Bible this verse, the truth will set you free. And so just sort of, sitting with that truth, you know, in a sort of mindfulness meditation kind of way, you know, allowing my feelings to be there, but also just continuing to show up and gently, you know, gently sit with it um, was really the way that I worked with it for myself. And then, you know, when I encountered resistance um, in my family, I mean, luckily my mother loves to tell a story. She's so great. So, you know, I would call her up and be like, can you tell me about this horribly painful thing again? I'm sorry. And she'd be like, sure, you know, and, and tell me the whole thing all over again. Um, so that was a real gift. Um, you know, but I definitely have members of my family, you know, I'm estranged from my father, unfortunately, but it's necessary. And then I have other family members who I hesitate to even mention, um, because I know that, you know, this, this is, this is not what they would have chosen. Um, you know, and in those cases, I was grateful for what they were willing to share with me. And I was also respectful, um, you know, of their limitations. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of uh, patience with people who, who were, you know, angry. I didn't encounter that too often, but that, that just wasn't really something I was super interested in engaging with in any um, ongoing way. So I would just kind of, you know, say, okay, well, I'm going to continue doing this and I respect that you're not interested in being involved in that. 
Well, um, my wife recently wrote a memoir, you know, Maud, so I feel like she and I have talked about this a lot, like that the, the aptitude people have for either being part of a project like this or the desire or you know, to call it hunger or some who are reticent and never want to appear in print. So I feel like you, you've juggled it all well and you've offered people great advice. Um, you've gotten two questions, if you can believe it. I love this nerdy crowd um, and I use nerd completely affectionately. Um, you have gotten two questions, if you can believe it, about your EndNote system, the way that you, which I want to say a way that the book is totally by the book, because the list of resources you consult and the kinds of, you know, looking over the EndNotes really is a how-to and how to figure out your family history. But the questions are, um, they, they want to know kind of why you chose this notation system. And um, I guess specifically, like, just how you landed on it and how it relates to kind of scholarly books. Yes, well, I am not a scholar, so I cannot speak to that part of it. Um, but, you know, initially I wrote the book with, you know, actual footnotes and the footnotes on every page so that I could keep track of them. They were a mess. It took me an extremely long time to you know, make the footnotes be something that I was happy with. I know you as a fellow proud nerd can really relate to this. I know when I interviewed you about Furious Hours, we we nerded out about your footnotes. So, you yes, know. I love this crowd. They're singing my song. I'm like, I love these people, but tell them a little bit more. So, I mean, first of all, they can look at your notes to see how you did it. They can look at your bibliographic sources, but um, do you have advice for kind of keeping track of all this stuff? Because obviously you were juggling a lot of materials like this. Yeah, I mean, I wish that I had been more um, detailed and careful as I went. I did have, you know, initially I had a note card system, then I sort of switched to keeping notes on my computer. And, you know, I also had a lot of books that had, you know, post-it notes in them, you know, so it, I don't recommend my approach. You know, if you have um, electronic books, obviously that makes it easier to mark something. Um, but yeah, I mean, I am just kind of an obsessive person. And so in the end, I really wanted to be able to source things for readers so that if I said something that seemed arguable or wrong or, you know, like an opinion that, you know, was coming out of nowhere, they could at least see what I was relying on for that. Um, and there's a lot of overt speculation in the book, and I really do my best to clarify within the text, this is factual, and this is how I imagine that this person's life may have been. And allowing myself that freedom was really important in writing this particular book. Sure. Well, there's one question I'm just going to allude to, and it's a great example of the book is worth the price of admission. Someone wants to know more about how you use DNA testing, um, you know, for your research, which I'm going to tell them it's worth reading those chapters. It's worth looking at your footnotes um, because you really get into it and you look at the science and you think about how it's been used appropriately and inappropriately and a lot of the ethical concerns. So that one I'm gonna flag it and acknowledge it and just say the book is really a wonderful resource for people who are interested in the connections between these. But um, I wanna move on to this question, which I'm gonna read part of it. Um, I, I think it speaks to kind of what we're doing here tonight, but then there's a there's a um, coda to it that I, I think you, you will have a lot to say to this person. And um, the comment first is, thank you for bringing in the spiritual dimension connection because this is core to the work we do. We are all connected. Um, which I think is a beautiful sentiment and true even over Zoom that, you know, we are all trying to learn about the past. We are all trying to understand our families and each other. And I think that's beautifully put. And I do think it's one of the things that's really special about your book. It sets it apart from a lot of other, you know, genetic queries or pure memoirs. But the second part of this person's question is, that being said, how do I include a grandfather's story a grandfather who abused many in my family, being sensitive to those who were his victims and who continue to be affected by his actions. So I know, I just wanna say, um, obviously, you know, thank you to that person for sharing. And I know there are experiences like this in your book. So, um, you know, I, I would love for you to share with us how you thought about those, how you did the work and just any advice you might have for this questioner. 
Absolutely. So, you know, I think in in a lot of ways, this um, this book would have been easier to write if I hadn't brought in the spiritual dimension. And, you know, some reviewers have been a little befuddled by it. Um, to my relief, they seem to be taking the tack that like, hey, this book is great, except where she ruined it at the end. So, you know, that's that's better than dismissing it altogether. But this is why you shouldn't read reviews. Let me say this for the benefit of anyone who bothers to write such a book. Don't read your reviews, but go ahead, Maud. Tell them, tell answer this question. I don't mean to interrupt it and actually appropriate and necessary question and one which you confronted over and over again in your own family. Absolutely. I mean, and so much respect to the person who's asking this question. I mean, you know, it's it's really um, a tough one. And I don't think that there is a universal answer. But for me, you know, writing about um, histories of abuse, you know, both abuse that I uh, myself suffered and abuse that, you know, goes back on my family on different lines and sort of pondering those connections. And there's a lot about mental illness in the book, um, you know, and as someone who's, you know, pretty obsessive and, and can be a little extreme, especially when I was younger, I, you know, I really wanted to treat that with respect. And, you know, I think, intention goes a long way. And also, you know, respecting that, you know, so I have a sibling um, and she is mentioned in the book, uh, but I really try to keep her out of it as much as possible. She's not, does not want to be involved in this. And, um, you know, and that, that can be a challenge for a writer. Um, and I explicitly mentioned in the book that you know, that her fall, her small footprint is intentional. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if you're thinking about writing about ex abuse that someone else experienced, you know, and they're alive, that's, that's a different question. If it's abuse that you yourself also experienced, you know, then I, I do believe that's, you know, that is your story. And, you know, as long as you're being respectful and not dragging other people into it, you know, in a way that um, is gratuitous, then, you know, I, I would encourage you to, you know, to allow yourself to sit with how that might be possible for you. Yeah, I want to thank you, Maud. I'm sorry, I feel like we kind of led you down this um, serious and sober road, which truthfully, you walk well in this conversation, you walk it so well in the book. And um, that's probably the last question we have time for, but um, I'm gonna curiously take you back to the beginning of it, which was this idea that we are all connected. And again, you know, I feel like there's like a couple hundred of us, if we were in a room, we'd be looking around, getting to know each other. We'd be like spilling out onto the street and someone would be talking about their great uncle Charlie who did something too. And um, maybe if I could just take you back for the like final minute we have together, um, you know, what do you think about that? And are you feeling it with the book? And, you know, on the other side of all this research for all the complexity, for all the heartache, for all the confusion and anger and angst, you know, does it feel like a wonderful thing to think that Charlie is not forgotten and that we are all connected? Or how do you feel about the project on this side of it? Yeah, I mean, I do, you know, the, the deeper I went into it, and, you know, by the end of the book, my awareness of our connectedness to each other as human beings was just um, immense. And then, you know, my, my awareness of our co connectedness to the earth and to, you know, I, I just felt, you know, and I, and I talk about this obviously more in the book, but it has really deepened my sense of belonging in the world. And one of the true joys of this has been hearing other people's experiences and, you know, learning about other people's families. And I see Margaret is with us and, ah, oh, what a joy. Thank oh, you. Yeah, thanks, Thank Maud. You. What a pleasure. I just really hope everybody buys a copy for themselves, for every family member they're going to write about. Just, you know, you'll love the book and make sure to pick it up. Thank you both so much. And there is a little more fun to come. Um, that was such an amazing conversation. I mean, full of research insights and 
the humanity of family history research and also the search for the ineffable. I love that. So there are so many great parts to take away. And we do have one really wonderful last thing um, to do here. We do need to wrap up, but as we do for all our authors in the American Inspiration Series, we're turning to you, Maude, for a closing reading. Last thoughts, words, some wisdom, please. Back to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Margaret. So I thought I would just read a very, very condensed um, section of my introduction, or, or rather my, my first chapter of the book. Um, this will be a very short reading, about, about two to two and a half minutes. Over time, the simplest facts of human existence have become to me the most unfathomable. We come from our parent. We came from our parents, who came from their parents, who descended, as the Bible would put it, from their fathers and their fathers' fathers. We begin with the sperm of one human being and the egg of another, and then we enter the world and we become ourselves. Beyond all that's encoded in our 23 pairs of chromosomes, our hair, eyes, and skin of a certain shade, our frame and stature our sensitivity to bitter tastes. We are bundles of opinions and ambitions, of shortcomings and talents. Every one of our forebears had hopes and fears, good days and bad. All of them took actions and were forced into situations that shaped them and that led to us. Each person on earth is a particular individual consisting of parts from other particular individuals. The alchemy between our genes and our individuality is a mystery we keep trying to solve. In the West, many of us look to science and genetics for answers to these existential questions we'll only ever answer in part. Why are some of us beautiful and some of us plain? some athletic and some clumsy, some depressive and some optimistic, and how much can our investigating our genes answer these questions? And what do our efforts to decode our destinies in this way say about us? In terms of DNA, we are no more related to most of our ancestors than we are to people around us on a train or at a baseball game. And yet, without each of the people who came before, who contributed to the genes that ultimately contributed to ours, we wouldn't exist in the way that we do now. Many of us trace our ancestors on genealogy sites that are becoming increasingly entangled with genetic testing. But after booming for a decade, the market for consumer DNA tests seems to be bottoming out. The reduced demand has generated theories Potential testers may be concerned about privacy or the tests, which a user takes only once, may already have reached most interested consumers. But there's been another shift in the culture, especially among young people, a recognition that the pull toward our ancestors is at least as rooted in spiritual yearning as it is in the desire to unearth empirical fact. Ancestor hunger circles the globe. It spans millennia. It's often been cast as a narcissistic Western peculiarity. Historically though, it's far more usual for people to seek connection with their forebears than not to seek it. Thank you so much. You have brought us right back to that concept of, of connection and centering us on that. And I really so appreciate your words. We all do. Um, that was great. Uh, I'm inspired to go right back to my family history project. Um, I do want to remind our audience that copies of Ancestor Trouble can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books. Again, use the code AMINS22 as you order online and you'll receive a signed book plate book plated copy of the book, uh, complete with all those end notes uh, and so many useful chapters. Thank you, Porter Square Books, uh, for your partnership in this. Catherine, do tell us a little bit about what's coming up um, over there on White Street and Cambridge, some upcoming events. 
Yes, thank you so much, Margaret. And thank you to tonight's authors for this fascinating and thought provoking conversation. I hope everyone has taken away as much from this discussion as I certainly have. And I encourage you all to pick up a copy of Ancestor Trouble if you have not already done so. Uh, but I'm happy to talk about some of our upcoming events. We are delighted to have a full calendar of April events and author talk, talk offerings. And you can find the details for all of these on our website at portersquarebooks.com event or visit one of our bookstore locations in Porter Square or a new location in Boston Seaport District to peruse our event displays there. But a few I wanted to highlight for you just now, uh, kicking off National Poetry Month, we are hosting poet, translator, performer, and musician Hala Liza Gafori for her new translation of Rumi, joined by writer, interdisciplinary artist, and doctoral candidate at Harvard, Kaith Heller. And that will be taking place this Thursday at our Cambridge location. Uh, next, the following day, we are absolutely thrilled to partner with WBUR to host Man Booker award-winning author Douglas Stewart at the beautiful WBUR city space to talk his much anticipated sophomore novel Young Mungo. And finally, next Wednesday, we welcome Plowshares Editor-in-Chief Ledette Randolph to talk her latest novel, Private Way, with the incredible Joan Wickersham, Wickersham, a local author, essayist, and a National Book Award finalist for the Suicide Index. Uh, we really hope to see you all either virtually or in person at one of our events soon. We have so many more up on our calendar, so I encourage you all to check that out. Uh, but it's truly been such a pleasure to participate in this event tonight. And I want to give a huge thank you to the folks at American Inspiration and everyone involved with tonight's programming for your work in organizing this fantastic reading and conversation. Uh, with that, I'll now pass it back over to Margaret. Catherine, the pleasure is ours. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you. Um, we at American Ancestors NEHGS are delighted to have co-presented with you tonight's talk. If you're studying your family anywhere in the United States, you may find our research center useful. The stacks on Newbury Street are open by appointment and NEHGS members can visit our digital archives anytime to gain access to 1.4 billion searchable family records. Free to the public, you can chat with one of our genealogists. Uh, you'll see on screen some great educational programs coming up from the Brew Family Learning Center, including an April 14 session on getting the most out of the release of the 1950 census. Uh, such an important thing happened a couple days ago. Uh, also do look at our multi-day course in May focused on building genealogical stills. We call it boot camp. And you will be coming to Boston just as the trees are blooming in this picture. Uh, this is a great time to do a deep dive into your family's history, uh, much better than January up here in Boston. And for you literary sorts, uh, join us for more free virtual author talks in the American Inspiration series. On April 11, Professor Carol Umberton joins us with her book, To Walk About in Freedom, The Long Emancipation of Priscilla Joyner, which looks at one woman's quest to define freedom after after the Civil War. The author's starting point was the oral history Joyner provided to the Depression Era Federal Writers Project. The book is fascinating. The event will be tech produced by our partners at the Boston Public Library. And April 26, join us for a presentation by Professor Anne Hyde about mixed descent peoples who helped to create our country. Don't miss hearing from this historian of the American West about her new book, born of lakes and plains. And finally, on May 10 at 3 p.m., another opportunity to geek out. We'll be jumping across the puddle to meet up with Dennis Duncan, a university lecturer and author uh, from London. He'll be taking us through the surprising little known history of the book index, revealing how this everyday tool has shaped centuries of knowledge and information. That is at 3 p.m. to account for the time change. Uh, to London time. Okay, back to tonight. Our mission at NEHGS is to educate, inspire, and connect, which was a real important buzzword for tonight. We hope we've accomplished this this evening and that you'll come back for more programs. For now, thanks to Porter Square Books, thanks to our guest authors, and from all of us behind the scenes, Maud in New York, my colleagues here in Boston, uh, across in Cambridge to Porter Square, Casey in Maryland, we wish you all a good evening and we thank Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are. We hope to see you again. Have a good night.